The following account was compiled from various newspaper articles, two eyewitness interviews, declassified medical reports, a phone conversation with a Hasbro board games representative, official statements from an Iraqville police department and Hannum State Prison, and a press release from St. Mark's Catholic Church. Attorneys for each of the institutions maintain that all standard protocols were followed and emphasize that none is facing any criminal charges. Wednesday, January 9th, 2013. Annalise Wright received, among other items, a Ouija board as a 13th birthday gift. Her mother, Kathy Wright, suggested that the gift be thrown in the trash to keep out any bad juju. She later claimed to be half joking. Annalise kept the gift. Friday, January 11th, 2013. Annalise asked her father, Michael Wright, to join her in using the board for the first time. She claimed that online instructions warned her only to use the board with at least one other person, and that her mother had denied Annalise's request because it gave her the heebie-jeebies. Since her younger brother, Joseph Wright, was only six years old, Annalise told Michael that he was her last and only option. Michael Wright declined the request. Saturday, January 12th, 2013. At some point between midnight and 3 a.m., Kathy and Michael awoke to the sound of banging against the wall they shared with their daughter's bedroom. Upon entering, they found Annalise awake and standing in the middle of the room. The Ouija board was upside down on the ground. When they asked her about the banging, Annalise claimed that she had a bad dream. After pressing her for an explanation as to how the banging occurred near the ceiling, nine feet off the ground, Annalise began to cry and asked her parents to leave the room. Wednesday, January 16th, 2013. After missing three consecutive days of school, Kathy insisted that Annalise be taken to the emergency room. Upon hearing the decision, Annalise broke down and admitted that she had been faking an illness. When asked why she would do something so out of character, she told her mother that the Ouija board had instructed her to do so. Shocked, Kathy admonished Annalise and told her that nothing good could come from spending that much time with a sick toy. Annalise responded by saying that she had no intention of getting anything good from the board. Her hope was to prevent something bad. Thursday, January 17th, 2013. After missing another day of school, Michael asked Annalise if there was anything he could do for her. She again asked for him to use the board with her, and this time he consented. Michael claims that he never intentionally pushed or directed the planchette, which started moving immediately when he and Annalise touched it. After pointing to several letters, Michael said that he actively fought against the planchette's path, but it was not strong enough to stop it. Terrified, he asked who was moving the device. Annalise, who was crying at this point, was unable to respond. Despite his efforts, the planchette spelled Legion before flying across the room hard enough to dent the far wall. Friday, January 18th, 2013. Michael placed the Ouija board in the living room fireplace, attempting to destroy it. He accidentally lit a shirt sleeve instead, and the ensuing flame caused third degree burns over 90% of his body. Doctors described the wounds as extreme and like something you'd see in a fatal car accident. Kathy, who witnessed the event and helped extinguish the flames by rolling them on the floor, claimed that the fire lasted under 10 seconds. Kathy endured third degree burns on her arms and was released that night. Michael, whose condition was critical, needed to stay indefinitely to prepare for several surgeries. The Ouija board was not harmed. Saturday, January 19th, 2013. Kathy awoke to the sound of Annalise's screams. Still groggy from her prescribed oxycodone, Kathy entered Annalise's room to find her two children standing over the Ouija board. Annalise tearfully explained that Joseph had used the board and that she can't even try to hold it back now that he's released it. Joseph did not seem to understand why his older sister was upset and left the room without incident. Kathy spoke with both children individually and, determining that both had calmed down, called Narakville Hospital to check on Michael before going back to sleep. When she awoke again, the house was quiet. Upon examining Joseph's room, she found that he had killed the neighbor's cat, Pickles, and cut the body into small chunks. He looked at her and smiled, which is when she noticed that he was chewing on something that dribbled down his chin. Horrified, Kathy realized that it was a raw piece of the cat's intestine and tried to pull it from his mouth. He bit her finger hard enough to require seven stitches. Before returning to Narakville Hospital for the procedure, Kathy checked on Annalise. She was shocked to find her daughter leaning upside down against the wall, propped on her head, apparently sleeping. Sunday, January 20th, 2013. Kathy had tearfully returned the remains of pickles to her neighbors and advised them not to look in the box. She had thought that would be the end of the affair. Later that day, Kathy was extremely distraught 
to enter Joseph's room and find that her six-year-old son had dug up the cat's remains and used the blood to finger paint his wall. The word legion was spelled out, despite Joseph claiming not to know what it meant. Upon questioning later that night, he was unable to spell the word. The neighbors asked Kathy not to return the cat a second time. Monday, January 21st, 2013. Kathy had spoken with the Narakville Hospital and was told that she could have Joseph restrained at the inpatient psychiatric ward if he was a danger to himself. Upon hearing her on the phone, Joseph became extremely distraught, yelling, please don't lock me away where I'll be alone with him. He was unable to explain himself further, instead sobbing inconsolably. Narakville police were summoned about the cat incident, but there was little they could do about an alleged six-year-old perpetrator. When the police left, Joseph smiled at Kathy in a way that made her more creeped out than when she found the blood on the walls. Tuesday, January 22nd, 2013. Feeling that she had limited options, Kathy contacted St. Mark's Catholic Church in the hopes of learning about demonic possession. The Wrights were not a religious family. Monsignor O'Connell of St. Mark's questioned whether Joseph had been evaluated by a psychiatric professional, advising that possession is only considered when all other options have been exhausted. She pleaded with him to come and visit the home, and the priest eventually capitulated. Upon hanging up the phone, Kathy turned around to find her son's hand around his own neck with his skin turning blue. He released his own hand just enough to beg his mother to cancel the appointment with the priest. Joseph claimed that he won't let me breathe, but he won't let me die. Kathy tried and failed to pull her son's arm away from his throat. He was just too strong, she explained. He started breathing normally again after she canceled the appointment with Monsignor O'Connell. Wednesday, January 23rd, 2013. I had hoped that things were starting to calm down, Kathy noted. Each hour, each minute, I was just focused on feeling normal, avoiding conflict, and getting through the day. Joseph and Annalise stayed home from school. Joseph spent the afternoon coloring while Annalise was shut inside her room. While his drawings were notably bloody and gory, they contained no words and no apparent cause for excessive alarm. Kathy checked on Annalise periodically. The 13-year-old appeared mildly annoyed at the intrusion, but otherwise did not seem upset in any way. Kathy ordered pizza for dinner. Her children joined her for a quiet meal. At 7.13 p.m., Michael Wright died unexpectedly. Thursday, January 24th, 2013. Kathy developed severe bouts of rage after her husband's death. Early in the morning, she forced Annalise to sit with her and use the Ouija board despite her daughter's protests, saying that it was time to put an end to things. Kathy locked them in Annalise's room as Joseph pounded on the bedroom door, imploring and threatening them to stop. Annalise was sobbing as her mother forced her hands onto the planchette, which vibrated beneath their touch. Both children protested louder as the planchette began moving across the board at a remarkable speed. With every hand occupied, Kathy struggled to record the message, but believed it to be something close to, talk to me alone, Kathy, before halting. A second message said, my teeth will feel so good inside your moist skin. The planchette then flew across the room and cracked the same wall it had dented. Notably, it was also the wall separating Annalise's bedroom from that of her parents. Annalise ran from the room, colliding with her brother as she exited. It took several seconds for Kathy to realize that Joseph was strangling Annalise. Kathy immediately intervened, but claimed that somehow this six-year-old was stronger than my husband. She was unable to save Annalise. Narakville police initially suspected that Kathy had killed her own daughter, but were unable to explain Annalise's dried blood under Joseph's fingernails. The nail marks matched the neck wounds documented in Annalise's autopsy. Kathy did not immediately call 911, claiming that she already knew my daughter was dead. Instead, she instructed Joseph to wait downstairs while she had some time to herself in Annalise's room. She claimed that it was the happiest she'd seen Joseph since his father's death. There is no evidence of what Kathy did in Annalise's room. Investigators noted that the Ouija board was found on the girl's bed with the cracked planchette pointing to the letter N. Kathy claimed that her last words to her son were, I'm so sorry, baby, but this is the only way to set you free. Joseph's death was ruled a homicide by strangulation. Friday, January 25th, 2013. Kathy waived her right to speak with an attorney present. There's nothing left in my life worth fighting for, she explained at the beginning of the interview. Much of the preceding information was taken from Kathy Wright's narrative. She was charged with one count of homicide for the death of Joseph. The district attorney conceded that, despite her unlikely account, 
there simply wasn't enough evidence to charge her with the murder of Annalise. Saturday, January 26, 2013. Kathy Wright was placed on a 24-hour suicide watch. The effort proved unsuccessful. Her body was found in a locked, guarded prison cell after the guards heard her screaming. They claimed that their keys were somehow unable to open Kathy's cell door and that she was too far away for them to reach through the bars and offer assistance. One guard, who spoke on the condition of anonymity, claimed that it seemed like something invisible was in there with her, tossing her body around. The official Hannum State Prison report and autopsy both conclude that Kathy ended her own life via head trauma inflicted by repeatedly hitting her face on the concrete floor. The autopsy took special note of the fact that such a degree of self-inflicted wounds is extremely rare, as most people lack the pain threshold needed to sustain such attacks for any length of time. Kathy destroyed all of her teeth during the incident. The guard's keys worked as soon as Kathy stopped moving. Medics had already been called. She was pronounced dead in her cell. Despite the bizarre nature of Kathy Wright's death, the autopsy noted that the most inexplicable detail is the puncture marks, several of which were spread across her body. Due to the shape, depth, and alignment, the only consistent explanation would be that, at the time of her death, Kathy Wright was being lifted by an animal's jaw. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.